Game Champs. The hope is to do uh, something about the Great Fire of London of uh, September 1666, or the Great Conflagration, as it was known in the period. Uh, my Microsoft program thingy I've got allows me apparently to put photos with video clips, so I'm going to do a separate video clip and try and put pictures in it. I'm rather amateurish at this, as you might imagine, so um, bear with it. Bear with it if you can, see how it goes. It's probably going to take me forever to put together and, and upload. I mean, the little one yesterday took me almost six hours, I think, in the end, it seemed. Uh, it's only four hours. So, see what goes and see what happens. Well, afternoon, gang. Um, we're going to see how this one goes because, as I say, um, editing is a tricky thing to do, but um, the idea of it, I suppose, is that I just talked to you about London. Four weeks now since I've last set foot in London, and it feels a stranger to me. But that's not the idea of the video. I'm going to talk about, for however long, I don't know how long I will do, uh, the Great Fire of London, which I don't always get a chance to really go into detail on the tour buses, and I've read a bit about it in the past year, uh, and uh, before I press on, probably one of the best books in a way, not the best book, is something known, called The Time Traveller's Guide to Restoration England by a chap called Ian Waterman. He's done a few of these books, like the Medieval, Tudor, Stuarts, whatever, and the Restoration book has a nice section to photo to London, because London in those days was the capital. Now in those days, uh, the Great Fire was known as uh, a few things, but chiefly as the Great Conflagration. Peter Ackroyd writes in his London book, uh, London the Biography, that uh, there's been a major fire effectively in every century of London's existence, which you know most people assume is 2,000 years, but as I may have said in one of the videos, vlogs or otherwise, it's at least over 10,000 years now uh, of London history. This fire, curiously enough, did not prompt the creation of the London Fire Service or Fire Brigade. Uh, that took almost another two centuries to happen, and the fire of 1666 was one of a couple of fires that happened in that year. There was one south of the river in Southwark, and there's been others elsewhere that did damage. I mean, the one in Suffolk destroyed about 30 or so homes. Um, it's a curious thing, the Great Fire of London. It started... Uh, on the morning of 2nd of September, which funny enough is my birthday, uh, around about 2 o'clock in the morning, 1666, in the ovens of Thomas Fowler's Bakery. Uh, though it was on Pudding Lane, pudding in the, uh, his pudding was awful, and awful was all sorts of things brought up by boats, I think, and carried in wheelbarrows from the Thames, which in those days was a lot closer to Pudding Lane than it is now. So Pudding Lane is not the bright and nice puddings, like, say, steak and kidney pudding that we like today. Uh, Fauna, little is known about him effectively, from what I've read anyway, and uh, he sort of disappears from the fire's narrative, virtually, really, from the off. I mean, I imagine there was some kind of investigation, but as, you, as I'll hopefully mention, that didn't really mean anything. Fire was alerted to by Fauna, really. His room was filling up with smoke, and he went downstairs and had a look. Now, fires were not uncommon, as I say, in London, especially in the city, or as it's now called the city. And he raised the alarm, in those days, you raised the alarm by effectively just shouting out your window. And as I said, there was no fire brigade. The firemen were effectively people who had day jobs. Butchers, candlestick makers, uh, anyone and everyone really. And uh, uh, they, during the fire, they had interests beyond the fire really because they were worried about their homes, their livelihoods, so some of them left. Now, um, within the first few hours, 300 homes were destroyed. 30 homes were destroyed, sorry. I'm trying to so I distracted myself by thinking just how many were destroyed. But um, it was a big enough configuration that within a few hours they got the Lord Mayor, Thomas uh, Bloodworth. Now, anyone really that knows an inch of London and its history could probably name only Dick Whittington. And some bright sparks will probably say to me, well, actually, I can name more than that. But other than Whittington, no one's really remembered 
historically though, Bloodworth gets mentioned. Uh, Bloodworth was a bit of an ogre, it seems, and he turned up at about 6 o'clock in the morning, said it would be alright, we'll sort itself out. An old woman can piss it out, which I can never quote. I've only ever quoted once on the bus because I made sure I had no children and people who were easily offended. So, he went back to bed. And uh, I always say on the buses that one can only imagine when he found out that Charles II was bloody livid, as I would be if my Lord Mayor, who had power only second to me in London, did that. Now, the fire started to spread rapidly. Today, we know pretty much where it started. It's not just off Pudding Lane on Fish Street Hill. Uh, we know that it spread quickly because... Uh, on one hand, it spread quickly because buildings were tinder dry after almost a year, a uh, very dry summer, a drought even, and uh, the embers were picked up by the wind and carried uh, away from it. So there were c cases of people fleeing down the street, for example, and all of a sudden the fire blossomed ahead of them, cutting an escape path off. It almost got onto London Bridge, but it was effectively stopped by the likes of St Magnus the Martyr Church and other bit things. Uh, if it had gone over the bridge, I would imagine it would have destroyed the homes upon it entirely and then spread throughout Suffolk because this thing seemed unstoppable. The confusion, it seems, from what I've read in books is that no one knows today why it spread with the violence it did. Uh, people living on London Bridge said they saw the fire leap across streets in three seconds. People said it was doing this, that and the other and moving in such a way that it was more than dry buildings, dry summers and the fact they were wooden buildings like that. So, you know, it's one reason why we, since 1666 it is illegal to build anything in a square mile uh, of wood. It raged for four days and three nights and it rearranged London forever. It destroyed uh, 60 odd livery halls, and today there's 128. And most of those were rebuilt after the fire <laughs> and then destroyed in the Blitz of 1940 41. It destroyed 80% of the capital, as it was in those days. I mean, there were places like Hampstead and whatnot, but they, it wasn't all known as Greater London in those days. And uh, it destroyed 87 churches, which in a way is a pinch of salt because in those days there was upwards of almost a thousand churches. Now, the blame game started probably from the off, they reckon. I mean, this fire by the second day was immense, more than anyone had seen in, in life. And Londoners in those days were God-fearing compared to what they are today. Hence why the only tradition that's 2,000 years young is still standing in front of a pub and not going to church. God was blamed. He was punishing, punishing a city of sin and vice, led by the most sinful king in recent memory, Charles II, the Merry Monarch. Uh, the devil was not necessarily blamed, he was credited because the year contained 666 in there. Uh, the Catholics were blamed for punishing a Protestant city led by a Protestant king. And indeed, uh, the French and the Dutch for whom we are at war, if anyone with an accent really got blamed, and the London mob has been a feature of its history for throughout, and there isn't really a London mob nowadays, but it could probably form after a tube strike pandemic or anything really that um, gets the gander up. Needless to say, we know it to be an accident now, but it took a century after the Great Fire for people to realise that it was an accident. I don't quite know how they found out. They must have been doing some research, but... Thomas Farriner put it this way, he never got dragged in front of a, a court. I mean, today, I'd imagine, I mean, I don't know my British legal system inside out, but Thomas Farriner would be brought to the Old Bailey or the Royal Courts of Justice and um, possibly charged with some short, sort of negligence and there'll be a massive public inquiry like there was after the Titanic sink in or July 7th for the recent attack uh, or the 2017 attacks on Westminster Bridge, London bridge and so on and so forth. So there would have been something I'd imagine and Farriner's name would be dragged through tabloids and on social media. And at the same time I'd imagine, and I sometimes say if I'm stuck in traffic, you know, Thomas Bloodworth would have been hauled before a parliamentary select committee and charged with a gross negligence of duty. I mean I can only I don't know what Charles II thought about Bloodworth. I mean surely he thought something because Charles II ended up taking charge of the firefight in two days into the fire and sorting them out, not in a dictatorial way, but in those days monarchs had power. 
And so he reorganised them, sorted them out, stopped them, them running away, or at least all of them thinking of it. And along with his brother, James, Duke of York, who became our brief James II, and his son, Prince Rupert of the Rhine, hero of the English Civil Wars, um, you know, they got he got going. But, you know, to be fair, Charles never got off his horse, it seemed, <laughs> to, uh, to help out. But he was meant to be this tremendous source of morale. And then in an age, even then, where image is everything, and things have to be... We're not necessarily as orchestrated as they are now with Buckingham Palace, like, say, for instance, Charles and Camilla's first public outing in 1999. Um, Charles was presumably conscious of just... Uh, his image. He had only been on the throne six years, five years since his coronation. He had restored the monarchy after 11 years of the Republic. He had brought the good times back. Theatres, football, Christmas were back. Um, the whole houses south of the river. That's the expression I've been using the bus. Houses of ill repute south of the river. Uh, everything was south of the river in those days for entertainment. Animal fighting pits came back. So Charles was quite popular for his restoration because the people by and large, had had enough of what the Republic had done and, you know, Cromwell telling them what to do. And he would have been called a dictator in today's parlance. And then it seemed his popularity, Charles, had started to dip. He was involved in the country in wars. He needed money and everything. And he was, you know, I would imagine it was knowledge somewhere that he was carrying on with a bunch of women that weren't his wife, most of whom he made duchesses. I mean, if this was a monarch who had today's media, he would have been crucified and absolutely forced out of the country, probably. So I would have thought in 1666 he was kind of aware that the people already turning against him could have possibly rose up against him, or at least thought about it. So Charles got Charles safe London in a way, but it's not the sole reason, of course, for London being safe. I mean, when you consider, as I say, 80% of the capital was lost, we were lucky with what was left behind. I mean, I'm going to put in a picture of the only surviving wooden building from before the Great Fire, at least one of them. You've got the Henry's rooms or whatever it is up by uh, the Royal Courts. And you don't get much of the tight, narrow alleyways left. There are a few left in the city, like Bow Lane. And there's, if you were willing to let your legs do the walking so you can come off cheap side toward. I can't say for sure if all of them that I'm going to put pictures of, like Cloth Fair and Cloth Court and Weiss and Sun Court and whatever, um, are pre-Great Fire. I don't imagine some of them are. Some might not even be from before the Blitz and after it. And that's the thing with the Great Fire. It started a serious effort to rebuild London. Um, as the Restoration Time Traveller book says, uh, in 1666, the fire claimed buildings that had stood for 600 years, by and large. I imagine they built buildings along the way, but it seemed that there wasn't that inclination that there has been since. And incredibly, London was rebuilt in five years. It was all mostly done by 1671, uh, at a cost of £9 million pounds in 1660s currency, a couple billion or whatever in today's currency, and we had no money for it. Um, Unfortunately, though no one got the blame officially, it seemed, in the uh, or at least no one was brought to trial necessarily, um, the London mob hanged a couple of people who they heard of accent. One of them was meant to be a mentally ill Dutch fella who had been babbling he had started the fire. So, though only nine people were meant to have been lost in the fire, and the first one was Farriner's cleaning lady who couldn't, or maid, who couldn't jump the gap between the buildings because she was scared of heights and then was consumed in the flames. Um, as some books have said, uh, the death toll is thousands if you consider those who died in the winter of 1666-67 from being outside in shanty towns and those who may have killed themselves having lost everything and those who were killed by the mob and whatever. So it, it depends what you consider but incredibly not many people did die from the actual fire which is incredible when you consider it. I mean, thousands were lost in the Blitz, uh, but over a sustained period. And the Blitz has accelerated what the fire started every decade since the war. We've had everything spring up. Much of the square mile in its heart, sort of Londinium, as you might say, is very modern stuff. There's buildings that were there built in 2008 that I saw some of the construction of. Uh, when I worked the original tour, they had not buildings down, which meant you could see up to the Old Bailey. Now you can't see the Old Bailey, so 
you've got the new chain shopping centre from 2016. Uh, they're going to be knocking down something soon by new change on the edge of Cannon Street. So it's constantly changing. It's a shame, really, because this is where London began and it won't end there. But from the monument, as you see from the photos, the view is as such that everything that monument touches upon is 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 more modern. I mean, Christopher Wren and a couple others got stuck in. He built 50 churches in the city and he did other things. Warren Athey College down in Greenwich. Bits of Whitehall Palace as it was then. Nottingham Palace, uh, Nottingham House even, which became Kensington Palace uh, under William III. And St. Paul's Cathedral is the best of the 50 churches, the most famous. But there's another one just above. St. Lawrence Dewey, where Samuel Pepys worshipped, and you've got others. Sadly, most of Wren's 50 were destroyed, combination of factors. The Victorians pulled stuff down because it was in the way for trains and the like. Uh, First World War, Zeppelin's got them for Second World War, and we've lost some since because of uh, age and the like. And only about 20-odd survive, and nowadays there's barely 100 churches in the city, so everything changes. But the fire... Uh, underlined how important how Londoners could deal with things, and they've dealt with a lot before and since, and they will do again. The I think the Great Fire is something to have a look about. You know, if you're interested in London history, you know, read something about it if you can. Uh, there's no, no documentary evidence. You know, there's no fancy films and the like. But um, one book I like is called By Permission of Heaven by Adrian Tinniswood, and um, for some of the vintage took it upon themselves to you know, the images flipped, but um, some basically take the bare bones and put it in a slim volume. I mean, this is 109 pages long, and uh, if you want something to help you out, like an injection or for information, this is it. And there's other books as well, many books on the Great Fire, but. And that's the beauty also of how things can change. Monument originally said on the side of it, it was uh, the papers and they were plotting, and now it says by permission of heaven, which I think is a very nice way of saying out of God. Monument's worth it, but it's tricky to come back down. I mean, it's not changed a jot in how you go up and down since the 1670s when it was built. And we we're unfortunate that there isn't the intended statue of Charles II atop it uh, that Wren wanted to do. In those days, she did that with your monarch, and Charles apparently looked at him and said, why would you want to do that? I did not start the fire. And a word about Charles before this ends. Um, he died in 1686, 87, sorry, 1685. My memory's always tough with it. But um, by the time he died, he had almost a dozen illeg illegitimate children and never produced legitimate heir and as I say he made most of his mistresses duchesses. Nell Grin he met or saw for when he was out at the Theatre Royal Drury Lane and he uh, probably the most famous of his mistresses and his dying words were see that Nell's looked after. One could say that's his priority but Charles's uh, his wife unfortunately couldn't produce children and as a consequence the throne went to his brother James who became a Catholic against the wishes of Parliament. He was chased out of the country. We got William III from Holland and then ultimately uh, we ended up getting George over from Hanover. So British history could have been quite different had Charles II had legitimate heirs to the throne and then they had legitimate heirs. The sure era could realistically have carried on into the 18th, uh, well into the late 18th, early 19th century. You never know. Uh, history is wonderful in that regard. What ifs are as fascinating as what we got because the path not taken is fascinating. Anyway. Hopefully, the pictures are where they are, <laughs> either on me or before and after the clips. And um, I don't know what we'll do next. Um, my phone can't take it at the moment. It's taking forever to upload these clips. So um, we're enjoying while we got locked down. I was thinking that quite possibly when this all is over and I'm able to get back up to London, um, possibly actually filming f a bit and bits and pieces out London. And so you can actually sort of see it in action and whether or not I'll carry on this and the blog that I'm doing or Taylor and Birds at blogspot.com, I don't know.
Um, so uh, have a. <laughs> if you are British watching this, or indeed living in Britain, don't go outside. Or we'll find Ray Winston will find you.